Hello everyone, I hope everyone is doing good and all is well. Today we're going to talk about, in my opinion, one of the most haunted places in Georgia. Now that's just my opinion, you all can agree to disagree, but the place we're talking about is Lake Lanier. Like I said, in my opinion, it's one of the most haunted places in Georgia. This lake has claimed over so many lives and not only that, it's just a deep, dark history of how the lake even came to be. So, with that being said, let's chat. Lake Lanier. Now, many, or some rather, I'd rather say some, some people know about Lake Lanier's dark history. Well, pieces of the dark history of Lake Lanier. But many people don't know the full history of Lake Lanier and how it came to be. Many people don't even know that there is more than one town beneath Lake Lanier. There's actually several small towns beneath Lake Lake Lanier's waters. Now, those small towns were not recognized by history. Only one of those small towns that lie beneath the waters of Lake Lanier has been acknowledged by history. And that small town is Oscarville, Georgia. But before we talk about Oscarville and Lake Lanier's deep, dark history, we must talk about the Cherokees who owned the land before they were expelled by the government. Now, the land, which was known as Oscarville, was once owned by the Cherokees. And we all know the story of how the government took land from the Native Americans, how Christopher Columbus claimed to discover or colonize America when the Native Americans were already living on the land. I mean, make that make sense. But moving on along. Well, Oscarville, it was once Cherokee Nation and the government, they exposed or removed around all of the Cherokees around the 1830s. Now, 80 years later, the second expulsion or removal of a community from Oscarville was the remo- removal of the black community. Now, Oscarville, Georgia, which is north of the perimeter of Forsyth County, began as a small rural town in 1870. Now, up until about 1912, about 1,100 black people owned land and operated businesses in Forsyth County. Now, before 1912, Oscarville's people, they thrived as teachers, ministers, farmers, and tradespeople of all sorts. Now, there were two incidents that resulted in mob violence of an entire community, which changed the town forever. Now, and as many may say, the town or now lake has been cursed ever since those situations occurred. Now, to be honest, I do agree with them, but you tell me what you think after you hear what I have to say. Now, as I said earlier, there were two incidents which resulted in mob violence of an entire community. The first incident was the one between Ellen Grice and 22-year-old, um, she was a 22-year-old white woman, I'm sorry, and Tony Howell. He was a black man, and I didn't really see his age at the time of the incident, but from the picture, as you all can see, he looks you know, fairly young as well. So, on the night of September the 5th, 1912, Ellen Grice and Tony Howell were found in bed together. Now, Ellen stated that Howell and his associate, Isaiah Prinkle, attempted to rape her, but they were surprised and frightened away by her mother. Now, I have several questions when it comes to this story. I mean, did they rape you? You say they attempted to rape you. They were scared off by your mother, but you all were caught in bed together. So how far did this attempt get? But anyway, those are just my questions. However, I'm not the only one who think that the story sounds a bit strange. Um, But we're going to get there in a minute. So let's continue and talk about what happened. After the alleged attempted rape, Within days, Forsyth County Sheriff William Reed detained the two men, Howell and Prickle, in addition to Fate Chester, Johnny Bates, and Joe Rogers. So she told this story that the men attempted to rape her, and they went and detained all of these men. Now, Howell was the one that she accused of attempting to rape her along with his accomplice, Prickle. Now, the other two guys, I guess they were witnesses um, to the incident, and that was Mr. Fate Chester and Johnny Bates and Joe Rogers. I'm sorry, the other three men. Now, after being arrested, the men were placed in Forsyth County Jail. Now, remember a moment ago when I said I wasn't the only one who has several questions when it comes to Ellen's story. 
Well, Grant Smith, a black preacher at a local Cummings church, he was heard to suggest that maybe Ellen had lied about the event after being caught in a consensual act with a black man. You know, at those times, it it was frowned upon for a black man to be with a white woman. That black man could, you know, lose his life for being with that white woman. It's not like times are today. We've come a long way when it comes to things like that. So, of course... You know, the whites of the town, they were outraged with um, this preacher's opinion. So he was whipped outside of the courthouse. He had nearly been beaten to death by the time Sheriff Reed rescued him. After Sheriff Reed rescued him, um, after he rescued Smith, an angry white mob stormed the courthouse. Now, while the sheriff um, and the local ministers, they were trying to hold off the crowd, the deputy, which was Mitchell Loomis, he saved Smith's life by locking him within the large courthouse vault. No one was ever arrested or tried for the assault on Smith. He was nearly beaten to death. Just for stating his opinion. I mean, he didn't say that she was lying or anything. He just said perhaps. And he was nearly beaten to death. Now, shortly after... The police, they stated that Tony Howard confessed to assaulting and raping Ellen, and he also implicated Prickle as an accomplice. Howard received the trial. He did not receive a fair trial, of course, because blacks were excluded as jurors um, because they were largely prevented from voting at this time. So he was not given the option of having a fair trial amongst his peers. So, of course, he was convicted. And Howard, he was convicted in February of 1913. Now, I didn't look too much into what happened after his conviction because I did want to stay on the topic of Lake Lanier. But I will go back and, you know, dig a little deeper if you all would like me to. But um, just to keep going, four days after Ellen Grice and Tony Howard were found in bed together, September the 9th, 1912. I want to say it's Saliti, but it may be Saliti. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. But Saliti May Crow, an 18-year-old white woman, was allegedly attacked by 16-year-old Ernest Knox. Now, Crow, she was found in the woods not far from the Chattahoochee River. When she was discovered, she was barely breathing. She was breathing very shallow and she had been beaten and raped. Now, there was no real evidence to connect Knox to the crime, according to the reports. However, the only real evidence what they claimed they had or the little evidence that they had to connect, connect Knox to the crime was a mere pocket mirror that was said to belong to him. Now, no one ever really said whether they proved it was his or not, but he did get charged with being there because they did say that that was his mirror. So the police, they arrested Knox at his house and they took him to the Gainesville County Jail. Now, while on the way to jail, Knox was placed in a well and nearly drowned by the town whites. So they pretty much put him in a well and filled it up with water to interrogate him or get him to tell him what they wanted to hear or what he knew. So while in the well and fight for his life, Knox confessed to the crime and he named several suspects. He named his 18 year old cousin, Oscar Daniels well Oscar Daniel. I'm sorry. There's no S on it. 22 year old Trucy Jane Daniel. She's Oscar's sister and Trussie's boyfriend or Trucy which was 24-year-old Robert Big Rob Edwards. He named all of them as his accomplices to the crime. Now, it said in the documents and everything that he was saying that they were going to help him get rid of the body and things of that nature, but there are seven different stories. So we're just going to keep moving on along. Now, Oscar, Trussie, and Robert were all arrested for convictions to the crime the following day. I'm sorry, for connections to the crime the following day. Now, their neighbor, Ed Collins, he was also held in connection to the crime as a witness. By the time the police got to them, um, well, got them to the jail in Cummings, there was a mob of almost 2,000 whites waiting for them. So I'm pretty sure that was a very scary situation to be walking into for them as well as the officers because their duty is to protect the suspects. So let's keep going and see what happened. So later that day, a mob of white men forced their way inside the jail and they shot Robert Big Rob Edwards in his cell before dragging his body through the streets of the town. So the mob didn't really do anything at that time. They waited until later and a mob of, you know, a couple of the white men, they forced their way on inside and they shot Big Rob Edwards. 
Now, after he was shot and drugged through the streets of the town, Big Rob's body was tied to a telephone fo- telephone pole just outside the courthouse in Cummings and used for target practice. Now, that's very, very sad and unfortunate that this man was um, done the way he was done. And this courthouse or this location that Big Rob was strung up at, this was also the location of the county seat. Now... Crow's death, which was the young lady who died, and Edwards lynching, that was the, um, you know, Big Rob, you know, Big Rob Edwards. So her death combined with his lynching, of course, that sparked major violence throughout the land. Now, the white mobs of the night, which were also known as the Night Riders, a.k.a. the KKK, we all know that's what their previous name was, the Night Riders. And check out my other story. It has a little bit more history in there about them as well. So the Night Riders, they went door to door with torches and guns and they were burning down all the black churches and businesses while demanding that all of the black residents of Forsyth vacate immediately. So everybody was upset. It was a bunch of mob violence and all of that stuff going on in the city. So the black residents, they quickly abandoned their homes, their land, their crops and most of their belongings because they were terrified. And of course, you know, the whites of the town that were there, they went ahead and picked through all the belongings and took what they wanted wanted out of all the things that the black people left behind now despite it being widely believed that the men were innocent so it seems like um, a lot of people did believe that the men did not commit the crime but however of course um, they didn't have a fair trial because it was not a jury of their peers so the jury did convict Ernest Knox and Oscar Daniel for Crow's killing. Now, the two men, they were given what is known as a trial in kangaroo court or kangaroo court, however. Um, and this is best described as when a verdict can be predicted in advance without good evidence to prove guilt. So on October the 4th, the town, um, I'm sorry, the two men, they were sentenced to death by hanging. On October the 25th, 1912, so this is after their sentencing, Oscar Daniel and Ernest Knox were publicly hanged with over 5,000 spectators, which included men, women, and children. That's very sad. Now, the people, they gather around the gallows to have picnics and all of that and celebrate pretty much as the lynchings took place. Now, according to reports, one of the boys was so small that a piece um, that they had to make a special noose for him. So that way, the momentum of when they hung him wouldn't decapitate him and splash blood on anyone's Sunday's dress. So they were pretty much dressed up in their finest clothing and didn't want to get blood on it. So Trucy Daniels, she's Oscar's sister. She accepted a plea bargain in exchange for testifying against her brother, Oscar Daniel. She was forced to be his executioner. And according to the subheading of this newspaper article, she helped fasten the noose around his neck. Mm, mm, mm. Very sad story. And the charges against Ed Collins, they were dismissed. Remember, they were holding him as a witness. Now, in the picture, if you look from left to right, um, okay, we have Trucy. That's Trucy Daniel. Then we have Oscar Daniel, which is her brother. Then we have Tony Howell. He's the defendant in the case of the first incident um, when it came to the alleged rape of Ellen Grice. Then we have Ed Collins. He's the witness to this event um, when the young lady died, Miss Crow. And remember, he's going to be let go. His charges were dismissed. Then we got Isaiah Prickle. He is a witness to the first event. He was the one who got locked up with Mr. Howell in reference to the alleged rape. And also we have Ernest Knox. He's the one who was accused in the murder, which was the second incident. Now, it's very sad what happened in these cases. And to this day, relatives of the victim, Sleety or Sleety, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, May Crow. They believe that the men were innocent and they have even spoken publicly of their beliefs that the men were innocent of the crime and did not kill their relative, Miss Crow. Now, over the next few months after the deaths, each sunset brought, I'm sorry, each sunset brought nightmares for the remaining blacks within the community. 
Now, there was a handful of black people that did stay behind and didn't abandon their things, but they were pretty much being tortured since those incidents happened. At sunset, the Night Riders or the KKK, which we better know them as, they continued to ride and go door to door and terrorize the black people. Now, they were demanding the black people vacate the town altogether. And when some of the black people did not comply, their homes were shot into, their animals were killed, and the crops were destroyed, among all the other torture that they faced. And those who survived the night riders, they went ahead and fled during the night once they could get away. So in total, nearly 1,100 African Americans were forced out of Oscarville, Georgia. Now, some of the ones that were forced out, they were still paying on the property they were forced to abandon until it was eventually foreclosed on by the bank. And all of the land was ultimately seized by the town whites. And as the years passed, the curse of the land became more and more apparent. Now, in 1915, boll weevils, they infested the lands and killed all of the crops. So the farmers, now, they eventually figured out how to defeat the boll weavers by covering the soil with chicken poop. And this got rid of the infestation. However, while they were getting rid of this infestation, they were also gaining the attention of the mayor of Atlanta. Now, the mayor of Atlanta at this time, while they were fighting the boll weevils, he was developing a dam to ensure the city's water supply. The mayor, he had then spent two years working with the Army Corps of Engineers. After all of this, he went ahead and decided to work with them for two long years. And he seized nearly all of that land that they had stolen from those black people. He he seized all of that recovered or stolen land from those farmers. So after that, after he had seized all of the land and once the dam was completed, He went ahead and released the waters and all of what was left of poor little Oscarville was submerged underwater. All of the charred buildings, because the Night Riders had pretty much burned a lot of stuff down. But all of those charred buildings, the cemeteries, the bridges and any trace of citizens of Oscarville was washed away. And Lake Lanier was completed in 1956. So this is how Lake Lanier first started out. So before it even became a lake, it had a very dark and brutal history attached to it. And who knows what happened to those other towns that are under Lake Lanier. They don't even decide to discuss them. All they say is it's other towns under there. So I'm... I mean, I'm just taking a guess in the dark here that maybe there was a dark history attached to those towns too. But let's continue. So Lake Lanier is a man-made reservoir, and it was named after Confederate soldier Sidney Lanier. He was also known as the poet of the Confederacy. Now, Forsyth County, it remained an all-white county after all of this happened for several decades um, after Oscarville was submerged underwater. Now, in January of 1987, Jose Williams, the same Jose Williams who marched across Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama in 1965. He attempted to lead a unity march in the Forsyth to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day, but he was met with white protesters and major violence. So he left. However, he returned a week later with Miss Coretta Scott King, John Lewis, Jesse Jackson, and 20,000 more marchers to the Cummings Courthouse. And this was the largest civil rights demonstration since Dr. King's funeral in 1968. And today, of the nearly 250,000 residents in Forsyth County, only 4% of them are black. Now, out of all of that and that big civil rights movement is still predominantly an all white county. Only 4% out of 250,000 residents in Forsyth County is black. But let's keep moving. Now, Oscarville. Now, we know there are other towns under Lake Lanier, but according to history, Oscarville is the only all black community under Lake Lanier. Um, like, but like we said, the other towns, we really don't know. We just know that they were once occupied by farmers. So we just gonna, you know, put it together the best we can. So Lake Lanier is 152 feet at its lowest point and it contains 
underwater forest with trees as tall as 60 feet. Now, there are trees, chicken coops, building foundations, cemeteries, bridges, paved roads, and much more lie under the waters of Lake Lanier. And there are actually um, clips, you know, according to divers and everything, as you can see, um, they've been taking clips of things that they've been finding under Lake Lanier. But I'm sorry, no way, no how, you'll never get me in there. But anyway, the debris within the lake, it has made it very challenging to dredge the lake for bodies once someone goes in. So if you go in, you're pretty much a lost cause because they can't really get in there to save you. Now, since its creation in 1956, Lake Lanier has claimed over 600 lives. Yes, 600. 600 lives. And there's currently 24 people that have still been reported missing from the area because they can't really go into the waters to, you know, search for them or save them. So they pretty much went into those haunted waters or were last seen around the waters and they've never been seen again. And the lake surface, it makes it impossible to search for anyone within the waters. Now, between 1999 and 2018, there were 57 boating fatalities and 145 drownings at Lake Lanier. And between 2015 and 2018, there were 43 lake-related deaths. And now let's talk about a few of the strange deaths that have occurred at Lake Lanier. So I'm going to give you all a couple of stories of just a few of the deaths that happened there. I'm going to give you an old one and a couple of not so old ones and all of that good stuff. But I would encourage you all to really go back and do some research on your own because all of this is very, very interesting. And if you ever decide that you want to visit Lake Lanier, you might want to read about it before you go trucking on down there, if you know what I mean. So in 1958, Della Parker Young and Susie Roberts, they crashed near Jerry Jackson Bridge. Now, one of the original structures of Lake Lanier was the Jerry Jackson Bridge. Now, they are said to have lost their car. I'm sorry, lost control of their vehicle or their car while speeding away from a local gas station without paying. So they pretty much didn't grab these folks stuff and try to speed away. And so they lost control of their vehicle over the bridge. Now, the women never made it home. And 18 months later, fishermen found the decomposing and bloated body of a woman floating on the lake surface with no arms and missing two toes. Now, the body couldn't be identified by the coroners at that time, but the locals near um, Dawsonville, they were sure that it was Della. They claimed to be sure it was her because drivers on State Route 53, they claimed to have seen her after she vanished. I'm um, pretty much they're trying to say they seen her ghost or whatever. And they're saying that uh, many people claim to have allegedly seen Della appear as a head, I'm sorry, handless spirit who roamed down the highway in a blue dress. Now, many who have seen her said she appeared to be lost. I don't want to ever see Della, I'm going to be honest with you. So, number two now, this is another strange incident. Around August 28th of 2011, so not that long ago, a Buford teenager drowned after a boating accident and a Cummings man, he slipped underwater and never resurfaced. Two boats with the combined 15 passengers collided, injuring two people and causing the death of Trevor Jones, age 14. So that's another situation. So here's another one. On May the 29th, 2019, two adult men drowned in, in Lake Lanier over the weekend. The deaths were non-related, so two separate deaths. And on June the 30th, 2019, a 28-year-old man, Corey Brown, he died after jumping in Lake Lanier to save a distressed man. Now, it was said that he jumped into the water and just disappeared. Now, in June of 2020... A crash caused the death of a nine-year-old and a 13-year-old went missing when the boat hit a, a pontoon. Sorry. And on July the 3rd of 2020, according to reports, a 59-year-old man jumped off his boat at the Ducket Mill campground and never resurfaced. And on July the 4th, 2020, so on Independence Day, a 45-year-old man drowned at Lanier Park around 12.30 p.m. Officials said he was swimming and went under but did not resurface. So it's a lot of people just going under and not coming back up. Pretty strange. 
So let's keep going. There's more. And these are just a couple of them. Remember, I said there's over 600. And on July the 14th, 2020, witnesses claimed 19-year-old Jesus Victoria Reynes, he was swimming in the lake when he disappeared and never resurfaced. Oh, yeah, there's more. And on May the 9th, 2021, there were several tra tragic incidents at Lake Lanier. The first incident was an explosion on a boat carrying several people. Six people were injured, including two teenagers who were airlifted to the hospital. The second incident involves a 23-year-old boulder whose body was found after he went missing that Saturday. And also, according to the Atlanta Journal, two boulders went missing after a boat crash. The body of, of one of the boulders, 59-year-old Branslav Prezik, he was recovered, but the second body has not been found. So there's more. On July the 15th of 2021, officials recovered the body of a 24-year-old South Carolina man who went missing in April after the wind pushed him away from his boat on the lake. On July the 16th, 2021, 55-year-old paddleboarder Jeffrey McElfrish, he drowned after um, going in after a pool noodle. So Jeffrey, no, let that noodle go. But McElfrish, he tried to get the pool noodle back after it floated away, but he became, you know, tired and he went under. He did reappear shortly after, but he went under again and did not resurface, which is very tragic. Now, his body, it was found shortly after, um, about 4.30 p.m. that day by the divers with the Hall County Fire Services. So we're going to stop there. Um, like I said, you all read up on Lake Lanier. There are a lot of different strange deaths that happen there. And as I said, in my opinion, and I don't know if you all feel the same way after hearing all of this, but I feel that this is one of the most haunted places in Georgia. Just looking at the deep, dark history of how it began and all of the spirits that this lake continues to collect. So with that being said, you all tell me what you all think, um, because the list, like I said, goes on and on. So just read up on it. Tell me what you all think. Tell me what type of stories you all come up with. I would love to hear some of them. Um, go ahead and please like the video if you haven't already. Share and subscribe. Please support if you can. If you would like to support, the information to support will be in the description box below. But if you can't, no pressure. And until next time, peace, love, and blessings.